Hi everyone. Does it work? Yes. Um, hi everyone, it's an extreme pleasure for me to be here and to present the work we did on how to learn to perform tissue and lesion segmentation using existing data sets that are task specific and heteromodal. So what we want to do is to develop a joint model for lesion and tissue segmentation. So in this work, we will be focused on the white matter lesions. So what we want to do is given a set of scans, for instance, a T1 and a flare scan, we want to automatically segment the white matter lesions and the different structures of the brain, such as the gray matter, the white matter, the cerebellum, or the ventricles. The problem is that there is no large data set that is available with the full set of annotations, so with the, the annotation of the lesions and the annotations of the different structures of the brain. Instead, there are some data sets that are task specific, meaning that they either provide the annotation for the different structures of the brain, such as neuromorphometrics, or they provide the annotation for the lesions, such as uh, white matter hyperintensity. So, and because these data sets have been developed uh, in the scope of tissue segmentation or lesion segmentation, the modalities that are provided for each of these data sets are not the same, so they are heteromodal. Uh, in neuromorphometrics, we only have access to the T1 scans, and in WMH, we have access to the T1 and the FLIR scans. So for the rest of the presentation, we will name uh, lesion data uh, WMH because it's the data set that contains uh, the white matter lesions, and, and we will name uh, the control data set neuromorphometrics because uh, the patients have no uh, large deformation due to paleontology. So to sum up, uh, what we want to do is to learn a joint model for tissue and lesion segmentation, given that there is no large data set that is available with the full set of annotations of the tissue and the lesion annotations. And what we propose to do is to leverage the existing data sets that are task specific, so either with the tissue annotations or the lesion annotation, but never both of them, and heteromodal, so either the T1 scans or the T1 plus pair scans. So basically, this problem lies at the intersection of multiple branches of machine learning, multitask learning, how to learn two tasks at the same time, weekly supervised learning, how to learn with missing annotations, and transfer learning, domain adaptation, how to learn from heteromodal data set, and in particular, how can we learn a knowledge from a specific subset of modality, for instance, T1, and transfer this knowledge to the fact when, when the inputs are T1 and FLAIR. So since we want to, uh, to develop a unique joint model and because we are dealing with data sets that are heteromodal, we need a network architecture that allows for missing modalities. So what we propose is a combination between HEMIS and IRSNet, two state-of-the-art architectures. So first, we extract features from uh, each of the modalities independently. Uh, so you can see here the features from the T1 scan and here the features from the FLIR scan. And then we average uh, these two feature maps. So when we have access to the two feature maps, we'll, here it will be the average of these two feature maps. And if we only have access to the T1 scan, it will, this mean here will be exactly the feature maps that are extracted from the T1 scan. And after, we perform uh, the tissue and the lesion segmentation on the rest of the network. So basically, this network architecture allows us to deal with missing modalities. The question now is, how can we train such a network? So first, I would like to give the intuition of our method. So in the lesion data set, we have access to the T1, the FLIR scan, and the, T the lesion annotation. So we can learn to perform lesions annotation by comparing the predictions, the lesion uh, outputs, to the ground truth. However, we cannot do so for uh, the tissue segmentation because we don't have access to the tissue annotations. In parallel, we can also train a network to perform uh, tissue segmentation using the T1 control scans that are available and comparing the output, the tissue output, with the ground truth that is provided in the control data set. The question now is, is the tissue segmentation working when the, when the inputs are T1 and FLAIR? The answer is no, it won't work. Why? Because when we learn, or when we train a network to perform tissue segmentation by using the T1 control scans, here in the mean, we only have the T1 information. And when the inputs are T1 and FLAIR, it also contains the FLAIR information. So this will create a perturbation for the rest of the network, and the tissue outputs will be noisy. 
However, we realize that the T1 scans are similar in the two data sets. It's on the part of the uh, brain that doesn't contain any lesion. So what we said is that we can use the T1 scans here from the uh, lesion data set, perform tissue uh, segmentation, and minimize the differences between the two predictions. So using T1 as input and T1 plus flare as input. And by minimizing this difference, we can learn to perform tissue segmentation when the inputs are T1 and flare. So this is for the intuition. Um, now we would like to move to the mathematical formulation of a problem. So we have access to a T1 and a flare scan. In the perfect scenario, we also have access to the full set of annotations, so the lesion annotations and the tissue annotations. And what we want to do is to find a function H, or our neural network, parameterized by the weights theta, that minimizes the differences between the output of this network and the ground truth. So for that, we will use a certain loss. And as we can see, uh, the segmentation map can be, in fact, decomposed into two segmentation maps, one for the tissue and one for the lesion. Now, if our loss function has a one versus all strategy, which is the case from the cross entropy and we just have seen in the previous work, uh, or the dice or the uh, jacquard, in this case, we can also decompose our loss function into a tissue loss and a lesion loss. So now what we want to do is to minimize uh, this joint loss, so the sum of these two uh, task-specific losses. So in this work, we'll be focused on the uh, data distribution that comes from the patient group, because uh, this is the group of interest uh, in our work. And so what we want to do is the best parameters that minimize the expectation of, the, of these two losses. So the expectation of the tissue loss here and the expectation of the lesion loss here. And for minimizing these expectations, we need to estimate them. So here, uh, we directly uh, can estimate them by using the, uh, the lesion data set. Why? Because we have access to the T1, the FLIR scan, and the lesion annotations. However, we cannot do so for this data set. Why? Because we are missing the uh, tissue annotations. So the question is, could we use the control data set? And the first answer is no. Why? Because we don't have access to the flare scan uh, in the control data set. So what we propose is to find an upper bound that is computationally tractable. So we want to estimate this term here in order to uh, minimize uh, this uh, term. So as we can see, in fact, it's uh, the expectation of the distance between the output using T1 and flare to the ground truth. Now, if our loss function satisfies the triangle inequality, which is the case for the Jacquard loss function, it's not the case for the dice, it's not the case for the cross entropy. In this case, the distance between the prediction using T1 and FLIR as input to the ground truth is lower than the distance, be the sum of the distance between the two predictions using T1 and FLIR and T1 only as input, and the prediction using T1 as input and uh, the ground truth. So this is the triangle inequality. And in terms of expectations, we obtain this upper bound. So here, the upper bound uh, that corresponds to this term, and here, the upper bound, the, the expectation, sorry, that corresponds to this term. The question now is, can we estimate this upper bound? Uh, so in fact, here, we can directly estimate this term by using the lesion data set, because we have access to the T1, the flare scan, and we also, have, we also need to have access to the same T1. So it's uh, possible in the lesion data set, because it doesn't require to have any uh, uh, tissue annotations. However, here again, we are missing the tissue annotations. So you will tell me we go around a circle, we are back to the original problem. How can we use the, uh, the, the control data set to estimate this term? And here the problem is no more on the fact that we are missing the, t the flare modality, but on the data distribution. However, uh, if we make the assumption that the distribution are the same on the non-lesion part of the brain, in this case, these two probabilities are the same. And so we can directly, so these two expectations will also be the same. So the expectation on the uh, data distribution of the lesion and the expectation on the control data distribution. And now we can directly estimate uh, this expectation by using the control data set because we have access to the T1 scan and the tissue annotations. So at the end, what we want to do is to find the best parameters here that minimize the sum of these three expectations. And all of them 
are computationally tractable by either it's using the lesion data set or the control data set. So this is for uh, the method. And now with what we will do is a mini batch uh, stochastic gradient descent. So at each training iteration, we will use one T1 scan from the control data set and compare the tissue segmentation output to the ground truth that is provided in this data set. We will also compare the, uh, the two tissue segmentation output when we use T1 as input and T1 plus flare as input. And finally, we will compare our lesion segmentation map with the, uh, with the labels that are provided, so the, the lesion annotations, uh, on when, when the inputs are T1 and flare. So this is for the training procedure. So at each iteration, we will compute the, the sum of these three losses, and we will uh, compute the gradient descent on that. So now let's move to the experiment. Uh, so we want to uh, segment different classes, so the white matter lesions. Uh, the gray matter, the white matter, the cerebellum, the basal ganglial, the brainstem, and the ventricles. For that, we have access to different data set, WMH. So there is 60 T1 and flare scans with the uh, lesion annotations only. We have access to neuromorphometrics, so we can combine the 155 structures into these six uh, tissue classes. Uh, we have access to 28 uh, T1 scans, and we can use uh, um, a validated method for uh, augmenting the data to reach 60 scans uh, that is validated on the healthy patient. So this is our case here, it's the control data set. And we use the uh, control data of ADMI. Um, and now we also have a small data set, so only seven scans, with the T1 and the flare that is fully annotated. So in this data set, we have access to the tissue annotation and the lesion annotation. So this data set is MR brains. So this is the fully uh, annotated data set, but as we can see, it's pretty small compared to these two ones. So we can uh, compare different models. So first, uh, the two joint models, so our model that is trained on uh, WMH and neuromorphometrics using our method. And we can also uh, uh, compute the joint model that is fully supervised, that is trained on MR brains. So here we have the full set of annotations. So this is M, and we can also compare a model to the task-specific model, so the models that only tries to perform tissue segmentation, uh, that is trained on neuromorphometrics, so using the T1 scans from neuromorphometrics, and the model that only tries to perform lesion segmentation, and that is trained on WMH, uh, using the T1 and the first scans. So for that, we computed the dice score on these different data sets. And so here, uh, this is our method. Here, this is the model that only uh, performs tissue segmentation. As, as we can see, we reach very comparable performances on this, uh, on this data set. So it's slightly uh, better, but so basically it's comparable. However, when we look at the, uh, the fully supervised model that is trained on the small data set, it doesn't work well on, the, on your morphometrics. We can do the same comparison on WMH, and as we can see, again, we reach comparable performances between our model and the task-specific model. And again, the uh, small fully supervised model, so the fully supervised model that is trained on the small data set uh, uh, didn't reach this performance. Now we also submitted our model to, uh, to uh, MR brains, because the MR brains is a challenge, uh, which allows us to compare a method with some uh, well-established methods such as SPM. And we can see that we outperform uh, SPM. So especially if you look at the white matter lesion, it's pretty clear. Uh, now we can also compare a model with the fully supervised model. So here, a model never have seen any uh, data from MR brains. Um, and as we can see, so if you look at uh, the white matter lesion, it's, uh, it's good. Here it's also good. Here it's also good. However, so we have two problems, one for the gray matter here and one for the brain stem. And we try to understand why, quantitatively, these results were lower for these two classes, and for the rest, it was good. And in fact, it's due to the differences in the annotation protocol between the two data sets. So the first row, you can see neuromorphometrics and uh, a scan from neuromorphometrics and the annotations that are provided. And here, a scan from MR brands and the annotations that are provided. And it's pretty clear that the brand stem in yellow uh, are not annotated in a consistent way. We can also see that the contours of the, uh, of the uh, gray matter are definitely smoother here than here. And this is due to the fact that neuromorphometrics uh, didn't segment the uh, CSF. So now uh, we can see the output of the different networks. So this is the network that is uh, fully supervised. We can see that it doesn't work well at all on neuromorphometrics, but it works quite well on MR brain, so uh, the same uh, data. Um, 
And now we can see the output of our network, and we can see that it works well on neural morph matrix, and that quantitative, qualitatively it works well on MR brains also. So here, basically, the, the, the brain stem is segmented similarly to the protocol of uh, annotation in neural morph matrix. So that explains why we didn't reach uh, good performances for the brain stem and the, uh, the gray matter. But for the rest, it's good. Now we can also look at uh, the output uh, on, uh, on uh, WMH. So here we have a T1 scan from the WMH and the annotation. So here we only have access to the lesion annotations. Um, this is the output of uh, the network that only tries to perform tissue segmentation. This is the output of the network that only tries to perform lesion segmentation. And this is a model. So we can see that it combines well this two task specific model. And which is particularly interesting here is that the input of this model are the T1 and the flare scans, when the input of these models are only the T1. So it really shows that we preserve the knowledge that we can learn from the T1 scans when the inputs are T1 and flare. Oh. <laughs> A small spoil. Um, and here we can see the, the output of the network uh, that is trained on the MR brain, so the fully supervised model. And as we can see, it doesn't perform well on the uh, WMH. So to conclude, uh, what we showed is that a joint model, uh, we train a joint model on two task-specific data sets that are hetero model. We reach uh, comparable performance to the task-specific model and the fully supervised models. And we can also see that the knowledge that we learn from one modality is preserved when more modalities are used as input. So when the knowledge that we learn from T1 scans uh, is preserved when the T1 and the flare are the input. So thank you very much for your attention. And uh, you don't have to annotate a new data set if the annotations are already available. Any question from the audience? Uh, thank you for the talk. Uh, in the derivation of your loss function, you make this assumption that seems for me quite strong that these two expectations or even the joint probabilities of the two data sets have to uh, be the same. Have you tried to estimate how big your the error is that you introduce if this is not the case? So what we did is that as pre-processing, we uh, normalized the two data sets uh, using histogram normalization and uh, uh, using a whitening, so uh, removing the, the mean and divided by the standard derivation. And so when we look at the uh, histogram using, uh, for instance, FSL, it was quite uh, working well. So we just did that as a preliminary experiment, but we didn't report it in the, in the, um, in the, um, in the paper. But you also have like the label distribution in there in the joint. So if this, if this doesn't align, so isn't that we mean, a problem? I'm, I mean, we removed the lesion uh, uh, information when we computed these uh, histograms. So because this assumption is only on the part of the brain that only on con contains uh, the, uh, the, uh, the lesions. So because in fact, to, uh, to um, compute this expectancy, it's only on the part of the brain without the lesion, so where we have the tissue annotations. So basically, what we are saying is that on the, on the different area that corresponds to the tissues, we make the assumptions that the distribution are similar. Okay. But not on the lesions, obviously. Okay. Thank you. Uh, nice work. I have the following question. So uh, in most uh, neuroradiology exams in clinical practice, you usually have multiple sequences available. So the fact that for one annotated data set, you just had T1 and no flare is basically just specific to a uh, publicly available data set, but not to clinical practice. Have you thought about synthesizing um, the missing sequence, the, f the flare images, uh, from uh, uh, maybe the T1 plus additional information from other data sets using some neural networks, maybe some GAN or so? Okay, so two, two answers. 
Uh, first, uh, if you look at the different data sets, so even if you compare to Brad, so the Guillaume data set, the modalities are, are not always the same. So clinically, even though I agree with you that we can have the flare in most of the cases, we won't have exactly the same uh, 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 set of modalities in the different data sets. Uh, so after to answer to the question of how can we generate um, uh, some, uh, some new data, uh, so the missing annotations, uh, so, so the missing modalities, sorry. So basically, there are some work, and especially we submitted something at Mika that has been accepted that uh, encode all the uh, different modalities into a, a common feature space using a multimodal VI uh, in order to deal with missing modalities. So it's possible to do that. Uh, but here in our model, we didn't try to do that. We really try. Uh, so it, it was really more on the formulation of the problem and how we can optimize this problem. So. Yes, we tried that, and it, uh, it's, it quite worked better, in fact, than this type of network architecture. Thank you. Any more questions? So I, I must admit I was a little bit disappointed by your results. So you, <laughs> okay. um, you show similar performance of the joint model and the uh, and, uh, task-specific models, which is already really nice, of course. But I had hoped that perhaps the two tasks could benefit from each other and lead to better performance. Um, what, are, what are your thoughts on that? Would it maybe in, a, in even smaller training sets uh, could, could so, happen? Uh, so if you look at the tissue segmentation, uh, it works better. So here, the results that we reported uh, outperform the tissue segmentation model that only tries to perform tissue segmentation. So, so it's slightly higher, but I agree there is no big gap. Uh, and it's slightly also lower on the value image. So I agree with you. Um, but the whole point of this type of approach is uh, we can see everything in terms of performance, but we can also try to, to create a joint model that is equivalent to this two joint model, because having a joint model has a lot of uh, uh, good uh, aspect, and especially if you look at, uh, if you try to do a uh, uncertainty estimation, it's really uh, easier to have a single uh, model and not two different models. So um, yes, in terms of uh, performances, uh, we have similar performances. We didn't uh, improve uh, a lot. Uh, we can also see that, in fact, uh, we so we have a new architecture now, and it, we reach a higher performance on the white matter lesion. Um, so this should also be submitted. But uh, so at the end, yes, the motivation was uh, that we, we have a better generalization using two different data sets. So we also have to show that. Um, but using a small data set uh, is not super relevant when we want to generalize it to another data set, so using the, the existing ones. Uh, so th this is a big aspect. And the other one is, uh, uh, is yes, in terms of, for instance, uncertainty uh, estimation, it's really easier with a, with a joint model compared to two different models that don't perform uh, the same. Thank you. I think we should move on to the next presentation. <laughs>